This is Electric Universe Eyes, and today we're going to talk about the history of Christian Birkeland from 1867 to 1917, the almost forgotten scientist and father of the Sun-Earth connection. This presentation is by Pal Breck, Norwegian Space Center, narrated by Electric Universe Eyes, but presented originally at the ISWI workshop, Boston College, July 31st through August 4th. The young Christian Birkeland, Olaf Christian Birkeland, was born December 13, 1967. Early on, Birkeland was interested in magnetism, and already as a schoolboy, he had bought his own magnet with his own money. He used the magnet for many surprising experiments and practical jokes, often irritating his teachers. Birkeland's early career. Birkeland became a certificate teacher at the University of Christiania at only 23 years old and graduated with top grades. In 1896, Birkeland was elected into the Norwegian Academy of Sciences at only 28 years old. Two years later, he became a professor in physics, quite unusual at that young age at that time, was called the boy professor. Birkeland Electromagnetic Waves Birkeland did laboratory experiments on electromagnetic waves in 1890 and first publication came in 1892 with some groundbreaking results. In 1893, he focused on the energy transported by these waves. In 1895, Birkeland published his most important theoretical paper. He provided the first general solution of Maxwell's equations for homogeneous isotropic media. Birkeland, cathode rays. In 1895, he began pioneer studies of cathode rays, a stream of electrons in a vacuum tube that occurs through high voltage passing between negative and positive charged electrodes. Birkeland concluded that the cathode rays consist of electrically charged particles and can be controlled by a magnetic field. This would lead to his major scientific finding to explain the northern lights and its connection to the sun. Birkeland, the electron. Birkeland was probably close to discovering the electron. The English physicist Joseph J. Thompson made the discovery, basing his conclusions on experiments Birkeland had worked on. Many have argued that German physicist Emil Weichert and Birkeland should have been recognized along with Thompson for the discovery of electrons. Thompson did, however, mention Birkeland's contribution in his Nobel lecture. Birkeland and X-rays. In 1895, the European newspapers were filled with articles about the new kind of rays discovered by Wilhelm C. Röntgen. He discovered the radiation by a coincident on November 8, 1885. They made a plate of fluorescent paint glow. The radiation was named X-rays, or unknown radiation. Birkeland told he had observed this radiation before Röntgen did his discovery. Birkeland and X-rays just a few months later, Birkeland demonstrated x-rays at the University of Oslo, February 15, 1896. A week later, I did a public demonstration where his audience could see the effects of the new rays. The same evening, he also demonstrated artificial aurora. Just prior to this, some doctors had argued that x-rays would never have any greater importance for medical research or practical use in medicine. In 1915, he planned to take a patent on a radiation shirt to treat cancer. Birkeland, other interests. Radio communication. Birkeland also conducted extensive radio wave experiments between 1908 and 1910 related to telegraph and telephone technology. He took out seven patents on electromagnetic technology, and together with Wallenberg and Sam Ide, he formed a small company called Birkeland's Patents in Wireless Telegraphy and Telephony. Atomic energy. In 1906, Birkeland sent two letters to Wallenberg brothers proposing to split atoms to create energy, arguing that one could get more energy out of one kilogram matter than 100,000 kilograms of coal. Birkeland, the inventor. Birkeland worked on many applications, spin-offs of his research. About 60 patents came from his creative production. This included mechanical hearing aid, power switches, harding of fats, redistilling and refining of crude oil. We can also thank Birkeland for both caviar and margarine, and his most famous patent, the electromagnetic gun, and he invented the electromagnetic cannon. 
Birkeland, the electromagnetic cannon. Birkeland was regarded as one of the best experimental physicists of his time and to find practical use of his research. He developed the electromagnetic cannon that he thought the military would buy. The banquet hall at the University of Oslo was filled with guests. Two ministers and Fritjof Nansen was observing from the first row. The cannon was supposed to hurl a 10 kilogram bullet into a wall. However, the cannon shorted and almost exploded. A large arc of light appeared. Birkeland, the industrial man. The test firing was a failure, but it marked the beginning of the largest industrial adventure in Norwegian history. A few years earlier, Sir William Crookes alerted the scientific community to the scarcity of calcium nitrate in the world, one of the main ingredients in manufacturing fertilizer. Crookes argued that if one solved this by retrieving nitrogen directly from the air, this would be one of the greatest inventions in the future and could save the world from starving. Birkeland, the industrial man. Birkeland noticed a large arc of light and the smell of nitrogen during the short circuits. He patented the technique to extract nitrogen from the air, and together with Sam Ide, he developed the Birkeland Ide oven. This was the start of Norsk Hydro, and by 1908, they produced 7,000 tons. A few years later, the capacity was 28,000 tons. Later, this part of Hydro was renamed Yara, and is still the world's biggest fertilizing company. Birkeland, the solar wind. Already in 1896, Birkeland made the important assumption that the sun continuously sends out cathode rays, charged particles, as well as photons. He based this on the continuous appearance of northern lights in the far north. Earlier, Richard C. Carrington had suggested particles flowing from the sun to the earth during the flare in 1859. And in 1910, Arthur Eddington suggested the existence of the solar wind without naming it. Birkeland was the first to suggest the ejected material from the sun consisted of both ions and electrons. He estimated the density of the interplanetary space to be about 8 particles per cubic centimeter. This is remarkably close to the average density of the solar wind measured today. Birkeland's Torella Experiments Birkeland made a series of different vacuum tank experiments. The first ones were glass discharge tubes. In 1896, he made his first artificial aurora inside a device Birkeland called an auroral jar. Birkeland's Torella experiments. Using an electromagnet, he could create a magnetic field around the Torella mimicking Earth's magnetosphere. The atmosphere was a layer of fluorescent paint that would give off light when it was struck by charged particles. Birkeland Currents Birkeland also launched an idea that the same particles that create the northern lights set up a system of electrical currents in the Earth's atmosphere. Such flows could explain the magnetic disturbances observed during strong auroras. Howled Observatory One of Birkeland's greatest wishes was to establish the altitude of the aurora. In 1899, he built two small observatories on the Howled and Talvikstapen mountains to solve this problem. Frequent storms, smoke inside, bad weather, and a deadly avalanche in 1900 almost stopped the activities at the observatories. Also, measuring the height was not successful. The Permanent Held Observatory, 1912 to 1926. Birkeland was for some years busy with developing the fertilizing technique and industry development, but in 1912, after an expedition to Egypt, he managed to raise money for building a larger permanent observatory. Here, several families with children worked and lived all year. Setting up a magnetic observatory network. Birkeland Solar Research. In 1908, Birkeland initiated a series of Torella experiments related to the sun and its magnetic field. He argued that sunspots were the footprints of intense electric discharges. He also took excellent pictures of the solar corona during an eclipse and argued that the radiation from the Torella strongly resembled the sun's corona. And only when he added a strong magnetic field, the sunspots converged closer to the equator. Birkeland's solar research. He suggested that the 11-year sunspot cycle must be related to the sun's magnetic field, which derived from internal electric currents. He understood that the dipole magnetic field of the sun would inhibit the emission of charged particles at equatorial latitudes.
charged particles flowing outward at polar latitudes would bend toward the equatorial plane. Birkeland studied the rings of Saturn. Birkeland was also very interested in the rings around Saturn. In 1910, produced similar rings around his sphere in the vacuum chamber. Birkeland studied comet tails. Birkeland was also into comets and argued that charged particles could interact with evaporated matter from the comet. I tried to explain the different types of tails and also thought the fine structure in the tail of Halley's Comet looked similar to the structures in the aurora. Birkeland, Rocket Propulsion Birkeland and his assistants carried out several experiments that were never published. Olav Devic told a story where they tested spaceship propulsion. In French newspapers, there were discussions about the possibility to move through empty space where there is nothing to push on. Birkeland said, no problem, but the propulsion will have to come from the reaction pressure from a cathode. He managed to demonstrate this in his vacuum chamber. Birkeland studied the zodiacal light. Birkeland was very interested in the zodiacal light and argued that it was related to the particles from the sun and should be correlated with geomagnetic storms. Expedition to Cadivial Observatory south of Cairo. After the first night, Birkeland asked the governor of Omdurman to shut down all the light in the city. He never found these rapid variations, and in 1914, he concluded that the zodiacal light was ultraviolet wavelength and wanted to observe from a mountain at 3,000 meters. He then started testing with the photocell in one of the cameras to detect weak light variations and was a pioneer in this field. Birkeland's sad fate. When he was going back to Norway, it was difficult to travel the normal route due to the First World War. Thus, he took a detour via Tokyo to work with some colleagues and visit friends. At that time, he was mentally unstable and ended his life in a hotel room on June 15, 1917. Birkeland, criticized by fellow scientists. Birkeland's theories about the northern lights and electrical currents in the atmosphere met great opposition among internationally renowned scholars, such as Lord Kelvin and British scientist Sidney Chapman. Lord Kelvin argued it was not possible that the sun was responsible for the aurora, since space was empty. Chapman said that Birkeland expeditions to the Arctic was unnecessary and his theory was way too curious. Satellites confirm Birkeland theories. In 1962, NASA's Mariner 2 spacecraft, on its way to Venus, measured the presence of an electrified gas with speeds up to 300 to 700 kilometers per second. This proved that empty space was not empty at all, but filled with particles, the solar wind. In 1966, a U.S. Navy navigation satellite observed magnetic disturbances near polar regions. This lifted Birkeland's name again. Electrical currents were detected by satellites in 1967 and 1973, just like Birkeland proposed. Chapman versus Birkeland. At the 50-year anniversary after the death of Birkeland, a large symposium was organized in Norway. An international committee decided to name the observed currents Birkeland currents. Even 50 years later, in 1967, Chapman stated this at a conference in Norway. Though Birkeland was certainly intensively interested in the aurora, it must be confessed that his direct observational contribution to auroral knowledge were slight. One young American scientist, Alex Dessler, questioned Chapman about Birkeland. I asked him whether Birkeland's work had any influence on him at all. How could it? It was all wrong. Just recently, Birkeland got the honor he deserved. Science on a Bill Birkeland, the first space scientist. What would Birkeland have done if he lived another 30 years? And what would Birkeland have been working on if he lived in our time? I encourage you to find the documentary by Pal Breck and Frederick Brahms called The Northern Lights, A Magic Experience.